Okay, so um, <clears throat> there's a handout, um, a two-sided handout, which um, I'm going to talk through. You probably don't need to look at it, except um, you might, by the end, want to look at the diagram on the second page. But um, And it's divided into three parts, so first I'm just going to try to highlight a few um, salient features of um, Matt's uh, project and then uh, have some reactions to what he does argue and then end with some um, speculative thoughts about a different role for attribution in responsibility and blame. Okay, so uh, by way of um, sort of uh, explaining or uh, reconstructing Matt's uh, position. So he's defending um, an attributionist conception of responsibility and blame on which agents are responsible for actions and presumably for their foreseeable consequences um, insofar as those actions reflect the agent's quality of will, where uh, quality of will discloses her true self and reflects her fundamental evaluative orientation, um, phrases from Watson that Matt, I think, endorses. Now, I take it that we can have different conceptions of quality of will. And so, for instance, one conception might be a characterological conception. One conception might um, require a mesh between first order motivational states and either second order mo motivational states or evaluative judgments. Um, and, and a third possibility um, would be to understand quality of will in terms of the agent's regard or lack thereof um, for the interests and the rights of others. And this sort of um, uh, understanding of quality of will, I think, is maybe uh, clearest um, in Scanlon, and it's the sort of thing that appeals to Matt, and so he focuses on it, and so will I. Now, Matt's a new attributionist, um, whereas the old attributionism distinguished attributability and accountability and denied that attributability was um, sufficient for accountability, the new attributionism treats um, uh, attributability as sufficient for accountability, okay? Um, now, one attraction of this kind of new attributionism is that it's easily reconciled with determinism and so less vulnerable to free will skepticism um, than some other conceptions of responsibility. But I take it this is a case where one person's virtue might be another person's vice, and you might think that you get what you pay for, and so the fact that um, it's so easily reconciled with determinism shows that it's a weaker, less robust conception of responsibility. Um, now, like any conception of responsibility or blame, uh, it has to be defended as uh, neither being over-inclusive nor under-inclusive. So an attributionist conception of responsibility will be over-inclusive um, if it holds agents responsible and blameworthy for actions for which they're in fact um, properly excused. And it will be under-inclusive if, if, if it excuses agents for um, actions for which they are properly held responsible. Now, though, though probably, as Matt points out, the more common worry about attributionist conceptions of responsibility is its being over-inclusive, uh, Matt, in fact, focuses on the under-inclusiveness worry here. Um, in particular, he wants to worry about cases in which agents seem to be responsible and blameworthy for actions that do not seem to disclose any problematic quality of will or lack of regard for um, the interests of others. Uh, so in particular, he focuses on cases of omission in which we're inclined to blame despite the agent's strong positive regard toward the person whom she or he or she wrongs by omission. And he has the two main cases, the first being Randy Clark's case of the unwitting omission to pick up milk on the way home, and the second case involves Angela Smith's um, uh, failure to remember a close friend's birthday. Now, though Matt focuses on um, uh, defending the, in many cases, defending the view that blame, in fact, is not appropriate because there's um, no lack of uh, sufficient regard. I take it that his considered view is that, um, well, we can't decide in the abstract, and there are two possibilities. Either one, the agent's commitment to another was sufficiently strong and irreproachable, despite not acting as she should have, in which case the agent um, should be excused because there's no defect of will, or two, the agent's failure to act as she should have is explained by an inadequate commitment to another, in which case she is to blame because there's insufficient regard or defect of will. 
And importantly, um, the sufficient regard for others is determined by moral rather than psychological considerations. So in particular, insufficient regard does not follow from the omission itself. It would have to be a need to establish independently. And so though Matt focuses on the first case, I take it as considered view is, you know, we have to consider the cases on their own merits um, and decide whether one or two is the correct description. And I take it that he thinks that once we do that, we'll find the attributionist commitments defensible. Okay, so much by way of um, uh, reconstruction. So some reactions. Well, so first of all, you know, I'm skeptical of the new attributionism. Um, in particular, I'm skeptical of the idea that attributive responsibility is adequate to understand accountability and culpability. So I'm an old school, unreformed uh, attributionist. That is, I do think there is such a thing as attributability, and I do think it may have some role to play in understanding some ascriptions of responsibility, some practices of blame, and as I'll go on to suggest, perhaps elemental mens rea. Um, but I think we need to appeal to other considerations, in particular what I would call normative competence or reasons responsiveness to understand accountability, fair blame, and a variety of excuses. So I think that attributionism or the new attributionism does in fact yield an over-inclusive conception of responsibility and blame. Maybe I'll say a little bit more about that in the third section. Um, but as an old school attributionist, um, I do think I could possibly agree with part of what Matt is saying. That is, um, perhaps I can agree with his analysis of whether to assign attributive responsibility in the cases of the omissions he considers. But unlike Matt, I won't assume that this settles the question about accountability. On my view, that will depend on whether the omitters had the normative competence to recognize their mistake and act as they should have and had fair opportunity to exercise these capacities. On this analysis, Randy and Angela's cases look uh, uh, accountable for their omissions. So if that's right, then an attributionist analysis that excuses their omissions will be under-inclusive on my view. So I'm going to end up thinking that the new attributionist view is both over-inclusive and under-inclusive, and Matt's only defending it against the under-inclusiveness charge. So um, that's the most relevant thing right now. Um, now, one question that occurred to me, and so I'm sorry I, I was teaching this morning and I wasn't here for the earlier sessions, and it may be that some of these issues came up, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's noteworthy that the omissions in Matt's examples are all pretty inconsequential, and so you might wonder what um, if the agents, though still well disposed to those whom they wrong, nonetheless omitted things of greater consequence, resulting in serious physical, psychological, or professional harm. So apparently you did talk about cases where the omission resulted in the death of a child being left in a locked car on a hot day, um, or you know, maybe a variation on Randy's case that you know, um, my wife asked me to file her application for some important job or something on the way home, and I forgot about that. Um, uh, now, I'm not really sure the significance of uh, scaling up these examples so that the stakes are higher. I mean, I, I take it that Matt might well just think, well, yeah, that makes a difference. It makes a difference to what the appropriate, morally appropriate level of um, regard or diligence is. And, um, but otherwise, except for that, the analysis would remain unchanged. And as long as we're focusing on attributive responsibility, I'm not sure I disagree with that or see that that wouldn't be the case. Um, a, a final question um, is uh, whether um, the examples of potential under-inclusiveness involving omissions, whether the omissions are really doing any important work here. And my sense was that they're not. Um, so first of all, um, there's a sense, I think, in which um, all or most wrongdoing involves omission, that is failure to express due regard for the rights and interests of others. So even when there are harmful acts or commissions, um, they're the result of omissions of due regard. So I suppose there's a sense in which all cases could be thought of as in having some element of omission. But second, it seems to me that the same issues arise if we change the examples in small ways so that they involve commissions rather than omissions. So suppose Randy's wife asks him to stop at the store, but not to pick up anything perishable because they're going on a long vacation the next day. Uh, but preoccupied with his own philosophical works, work, he stops at the, uh, at the store and he shops on autopilot, buying the usual large quantities of milk and produce. Um, 
Or suppose Angela's friend is allergic to chocolate, and Angela you know, knew this, but she's preoccupied with planning the details of an elaborate birthday party for her friend, and she forgets and orders the chocolate birthday cake. Um, it seems to me all the same issues arise, and I don't see that they need to be treated any differently, in which case um, the paper's really more about defending um, attributionism against charges of under-inclusiveness and not specifically with regard to omissions. So um, because I think that's true, I'll end by um, making some different, some alternative suggestions about the role of attributability in accountability and culpability. Um, so my comments will focus on the criminal law, and, uh, but I think that uh, moral responsibility has a similar structure, which isn't to say that moral and criminal responsibility are indistinguishable, but um, I think most of the relevant points would carry over. Um, so I think there's more to responsibility and culpability than attributability. Having insufficient regard for the interests and rights of others may be necessary for criminal responsibility, but it's not sufficient. Even when wrongdoing can be attributed to agents, they are not accountable for it because it would be unfair to blame them for it if they lacked adequate capacity or opportunity to avoid the wrongdoing. So for instance, incompetence is an excuse that denies capacity and duress is an excuse that denies opportunity. Now, Matt talks briefly about some cases involving duress or coercion and I agree with him that it's possible that duress would cancel attributability. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, as it were, overdetermined that duress ex excuses. It excuses on one model because it denies um, agents fair opportunity to, to exercise their normative capacities. Um, and then on Matt's view, um, it excuses not for that reason, but because um, it uh, shows that there wasn't actually insufficient regard. So when I commit wrong as the result of a threat from another, um, that's supposed to show that it wasn't um, my insufficient regard for the other that um, uh, I, I, my wrongdoing expresses. Okay. Um, uh, but I think incompetence excuses are different, and I think um, their concern fair opportunity to avoid wrongdoing and not quality of will. And so here maybe, I'm not sure what the best um, illustration of this is, but I mean, Matt referenced the psychopathy stuff. And, so Matt and I actually share a conclusion about psychopathy, and that is that psychopathy, um, psychopaths um, aren't, uh, aren't to be excused. And um, Matt's reason is because he thinks they still display the relevant defects in quality of will. On my view, it's because though the test for whether they should be excused is capacity, um, unlike other people who discuss this matter, I think that there's reason to think that psychopaths have the relevant capacities. But suppose you thought, as others who share my view about responsibility but disagree about psychopathy thought, suppose you thought that psychopaths lack some kind of significant normative capacity, either cognitive or volitional capacities. Then it seems to me, um, uh, what, you would, you would think that um, they should not be held responsible, but you wouldn't think it because there's no defect in their will, because presumably they still are malicious and so forth. Um, and so they have the relevant defects of the will, and so um, uh, for that reason Matt holds them responsible, but I don't think they should be held responsible if it, if it turns out that they don't have the relevant cognitive or volitional capacities. I just happen to think they do, but um, anyway. Uh, so we can distinguish two kinds of culpability at work in the criminal law that play different roles in a broadly retributivist constraint on blame and punishment that it be reserved for culpable wrongdoing. There's what's often called narrow culpability specified in terms of elemental mens rea, so in terms of, say, model penal code doctrines, whether the agent, um, one, intended the harm, whether two, she foresaw but did not intend the harm, whether three, she was re reckless with respect to the harm, or whether for she was negligent with respect to the harm. So narrow culpability is the subjective or intentional aspect of wrongdoing. By contrast, another notion of culpability, broad culpability, is the sort of responsibility for wrongdoing without which blame and punishment would be unfair. Agents who have committed wrong and hence are narrowly culpable are not broadly culpable if they lack sufficient capacity or opportunity to avoid the wrongdoing. 
So on this picture, narrow and broad culpability combine to play complementary roles in criminal responsibility. And we could represent this propositionally or diagrammatically. So propositionally, we might say that elemental mens rea, by which we mean narrow culpability, and actus reus are individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions for wrongdoing. But then we might claim, too, that only wrongdoing that the agent had the capacity and the opportunity to avoid is an apt target for blame and punishment. That would be to offer that conception of broad culpability. So we could represent that in terms of a diagram. So blame and punishment presuppose both wrongdoing and broad culpability, which I would want to interpret in terms of normative competence and fair opportunity, or capacity and opportunity. And then wrongdoing itself has two components, the actus reus component and the elemental mens rea component, where narrow culpability is supplying the elemental mens rea component. OK, so what does this have to do with attributability? Well, one suggestion is that um, we interpret these two conceptions of culpability in terms of the distinction between attributability and accountability. Narrow culpability reflects attributability considerations insofar as it reflects the quality of the agent's will, whether she intended harm, whether she tolerated harm as a byproduct of her actions, whether she was reckless with respect to harm, or whether she was negligent with respect to harm. Whereas broad culpability reflects accountability insofar as it reflects whether the agent had sufficient capacity and opportunity without which blame and punishment would be unfair. So that gives a, a role to attributability, but it's not the sort of all-encompassing role that Matt's new attributionism would assign it. Those comments are very helpful, and especially about the, um, the points about the relationship between omission and commission in these cases. And I, th I think you're right about that. Um, maybe ultimately, the, the, the wittingness uh, is perhaps the core, or unwittingness as the case may be. Uh, but what I suppose I'll say in a few minutes is, is I'll try to defend the other aspect of attributionism, the, the aspect that denies the, the normative competence condition. I mean, I get why people insist on normative competence as a condition on blameworthiness. It seems unfair to blame somebody who wasn't normatively competent because insofar as they lack that competence, they couldn't have uh, done the right thing for the right reasons. They have difficulty avoiding blame. But I think that that objection or that position trades on a bit of misdirection or um, the cases in which it really makes sense to say it was difficult for her to avoid blame, so it's unfair to blame her, are cases of compulsion and coercion and so forth. In those cases, I really get it. Yeah, it would be unfair to blame her. But I'll explain that in terms of them not meeting the attribution conditions. On the other hand, take a case in which somebody's normative competence is undermined by her thoroughgoing commitment to her terrible moral values. The committed racist, for instance. The committed racist may, in virtue of her commitment to her uh, morally horrific outlook, have great difficulty recognizing the true moral status of her behavior. But I have a lot of trouble seeing why that should insulate her from blame, why it would make it inappropriate for her victims to resent her in the, in the norm, when she intentionally injures them because she thinks they're open to that kind of treatment. So I don't think that in every case, difficulty of avoiding blame uh, reliably elicits, elicits the intuition of, of unfairness. Um, and moreover, I, I guess I'm just committed to a, an actual sequence account of moral responsibility. Um, and if we focus on the actual sequence, then we ought to focus on what actually explains her behavior, the motivations that she actually had. And we shouldn't care whether or not she has access to alternative physical possibilities, nor whether she has access to alternative psychological possibilities. An agent's behavior might be psychologically determined, but she has she does what she wants to do. She does it intentionally, and it expresses who she is in a way that, in, on my view, makes her an appropriate target for the reactive attitudes. Um, I don't see how other compatibilist approaches, accounts of could have done otherwise that are compatible with determinism, I don't see how the opportunity to avoid blame 
that those accounts give us makes it so makes it obvious that the person deserves blame. So ultimately, we're stuck with this picture on which, well, if she'd been, if you know, some sort of conditional analysis, uh, you know, if if she'd been different in some way, then she would have acted differently. But of course, she lacked control over that. So. Um, if, if, I, if I'm not committed to the view that we just take her as she is and just look at what actually explains her behavior, then I don't see how we get dessert of blame off the ground. I don't see how adding alternatives of the sort that would be compatible with determinism adds anything that's relevant to blameworthiness. So I say we don't need to worry about it. But that's a, that's, sorry, that's a bit off the subject of the paper. So I'll just, I'll just stop with that. But I did want to get that out there. I, So uh, I'm Craig Aguil. I'm a graduate student here. Uh, thanks for the talk. I really liked it. Um, I have a question that's maybe going to follow up on David's suggestion that there's nothing distinctive about omissions. Um, and so this is maybe, maybe the reason why you might have thought omissions were distinctive. You might have thought it's because there's something interesting about the causal relations there. Or maybe you thought. Uh, not you, one, mm -hmm. one thought there's something like ontologically interesting about omission, like where is the omission in that kind of stuff. And so I'm curious if it, and this might be friendly, um, if it supports your claim and maybe also David's observation, if you think, well, if, if I'm a new attributionist, what I care about is the quality of will, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. and the upshot, the action, the omission, whatever it is, is evidential, right? right. Um, and so, uh, you know, if I, I, I lose some of the worries about causation, I lose some of the worries about actually finding a thing that mm -hmm. I can identify, because what I really care about is just what lies underneath, not the evidence. So I don't know if that... Yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm... I'm, I'm happy to, to agree with David. I mean, I think he's right, and I think he gave a, a compelling account of, of why the same might apply to, to, to commissions. Uh, it, I was thinking of these examples of omissions, and maybe they draw our attention or my attention because we lack the evidence um, that, you know, there's an absence there. Uh, but it does seem as if there's a, a causal upshot, but it's a little, it's trickier to make the attribution in those cases. But I agree that the same might be true for... Um, Actions that you did inadvertently, um, because it was in, in, because it was inadvertent, it might also be difficult to make the attribution. But I think your way of putting it is helpful, certainly. Okay, Seventeen. Yes, yes. Um, I, I was looking at you the whole time, but I, you're, you're backlit, and I couldn't make out was, your facial expressions at all. So. Yeah, that was really <laughs> well argued. You, you've got me half convinced. Um, um, so, my, my job is but, over then. Uh, that's, that's sorry? More, that's more than I would have hoped for. Yeah. So I'm so, all right, so here's a, something I'm wondered, uh, wondering about about your views. So I'm wondering, so what, um, what is my excuse? Um, so, uh, or Clark won. He's, got the, he's the, the good-willed agent, uh, but he forgets. And is it that he has, he doesn't, ha he lacks uh, poor quality of will. Is that his excuse, or is it whatever factor leads to the getting. Um, to, to clarify, could you compare him with Clark too, who's not a monster, but he does have uh, deficient concern for others and commitment to, deficient commitment to keep his promises and so forth. And, and he forgets too, but now, you know, most people who are similarly, you know, deficient, most of the time remember. Um, and suppose it's sort of just a similar mm -hmm. sort of Fallibility of memory, uh, something we're all subject to. Um, so it's the same kind of factor that uh, 
you know, causes the forgetting in his case, as does in Clark 1. Yeah. Um, so does Clark 2 have the same excuse? Or, or is it really what excuses Clark 1 is just, is not what caused the memory failure, but uh, rather he just, you know, is, is the, the purity of his will or something? Yeah, uh, I guess I could go either way. Um, it, let's assume that every, whenever you forget something, there'll be some cause that explains why you forgot it. And as long as that cause isn't related with or expressive of or indicative of something that's independently objectionable, a quality of will, a bad attitude, then you're excused. So you could say, well, I'm excused because what caused it was this. But implicit in that is it was this and not that other thing the ba on the basis of which I would have been blameworthy. But I think the normal thing to do is just you, 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 you plead with somebody to to believe you that it didn't mean anything, that they shouldn't make an inference from your forgetting. Now, of course, you can do that sincerely or insincerely, right? I mean, it may, maybe it was that you don't care enough, but you, you, you still insist that that's not the case. And there may, we may not be able to tell. We may not have evidence one way or the other. Though in that case, I might say, well, we should, we should withhold judgment. But so with respect to the answer, I think, is I could say either one of the two things that you suggested for one, the goodwilled agent. The goodwilled agent could, if he knew what it was that caused him to forget, he could cite that. And in citing that, he would be drawing attention away from the other explanation that casts him in a morally poor light. Or he could just insist that one ought not infer that he is, has these condemnable attitudes. Because most of the time, we don't know what causes us to forget stuff, right? I mean, there's a cause, right, right. something, but. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about your treatment of the of Angela Smith's forgetting the birthday case, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so. Say you thought, which I think maybe Angela Smith thinks this, um, and it seems plausible to me. So say you thought that, that, that rationality made demands on our allocations of attention, and that you also thought that attention was a, was a finite resource. So that, for mm -hmm. instance, what rationality requires is that you, um, that you attend to things in accordance with how much you care about them. And then one of the results is that sometimes things that you care about don't get any of your attention. That is, you fall short of this norm of rationality because you have a limited resource and because other things you care more about mm -hmm. draw your attention more. Um, so then, then you might think the way in which you should be thinking about whether or not the forgetting of the birthday indicates a lack of caring, um, you always have to be thinking of it in connection with this particular norm of rationality. So that the way in which somebody is going to succeed in excusing themselves when they forget is by telling a story about how they were in compliance with the norm of rationality demanding the allocation of attention, uh -huh. and that in being in compliance with that, yeah. they show themselves to have there there was an there was a, a full explanation for the failure to attend in this instance, which showed them to actually, there was a good story as to why they, why they allocated their attention the way that they did. Mm -hmm. So it was allocated to the, you know, to the leading child in the back seat rather than to the friend's birthday. Um, and so when you start thinking about it that way, although you might start recognizing that there's a pretty large number of cases in which people who care plenty forget, I think it's going to be very rare for the cases in which people who care plenty forget and have an excuse by these men, by these lights. The norm, because, of, the norm of allocation of lights. Right, because <clears throat> that is, because it looks like what they're gonna need in order to show themselves to be excused is some story under which this allocation, the allocation of attention, the appropriate allocation of attention in this instance to the friend's birthday was zero. Now that's, th those cases are gonna seem to me to be quite rare. So that is, f forms of inadvertent, forms of things in the environment that cause us in general to get distracted, what they cause is irrationality in the allocation of attention. Uh -huh. And so they're not causing excuse, because for there to cause excuse, they have to, they, there has to be <coughs> rationality in the allocation of attention, which, was, which, result, which resulted in no allocation of attention to the friend's birthday. See what I'm saying? Uh, I thought I'd, 
did. Um, so initially I was thinking, okay, look, I've got all these things that I care about. I need to attend to all of them or try to if I can, uh, but, but they're, they're weighted. And so some of them get more of my attention. I'm not sure exactly what that means. They get more of my attention than others. So that leaves it open that I might forget about any of them, but it's more likely that I'll forget about the stuff that I've allocated less attention to. Right? I was thinking of the forgetting as, a, as an allocation of zero attention. Yeah, see, I, that wasn't how I was thinking of it. I was thinking of, of, thinking of allocation of attention as uh, fixing a kind of probability that you'll remember it. Like, the really important stuff, I've got to remember that. And so, you know, I probably will. I might, might possibly forget. And the stuff that's only middling important, I might forget about it. Uh, that's what I was thinking. But, but you're thinking of allocation of zero is the explanation well, maybe it doesn't matter which, which okay. picture we have. I mean, my thought was just the crucial for the excuse, for excusing yourself when, when for forgetting requires telling a story under which, the rash, with, under which rationality required of you that you not remember. And that's going to be extraordinarily rare. So that is the, the, the yeah. vast majority of cases of, the forgetting, of forgetting are something something causes you to be irrational. Uh -huh. Yeah, and so, so th you could say what I want to say, but it would be at that point. Exactly. About at the, at the rationality of your allocation. Yeah. Right, and once you've done that, then, well, of course you're gonna forget, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I, I like that idea of allocating your attention. And I suppose that is, that seems psychologically plausible. I mean, and I go, actually, there's a lot of research on that side, so, you know, acting under cognitive load and so yeah. forth. And... Two. Thanks. Um, thanks for a great paper and great comments. Um, and my, my question actually has to do with this uh, debate at, uh, that, um, at the end of David's comments about uh, the disagreement of, uh, about whether uh, attributability is sufficient for accountability. Um, and the question, this question came up in, because of your response to David. Um, so, uh, so it's, very, it's very sort of a neat disagreement uh, as David represents it here and as I think you were accepting it, but I was wondering if it is so neat and whether you were willing to accept all that was built into accountability on David's picture. Um, part of the thought there is and on, on the di diagram, it says blame and punishment, um, uh -huh. for example, and there was going to be this parallel. And, but then when you were saying, no, the reason I think attributability is sufficient for accountability is that it, um, isn't it appropriate, say, for the victims of mm -hmm. racist uh, acts to, uh, to be resentful and that sort of thing. And, um, and so maybe that gets you all the way to the appropriateness of punishment or something like that, and I think you did mention dessert, but I suppose you could think there's some, uh, there, there's the, those things, some of those things could come apart from each other. So I just want yeah. to know, are you on board with the whole thing? No. Is it is attributability really sufficient for all of that? No, no. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly one of those people who thinks that blame, blame is not punishment. Um, punishment is a, a, follows from a decision that we would make in answers to different standards than do our emotional responses. And I'm not a retributivist, I don't think, so I don't think that what I, I don't take what I say to apply to, to punishment. Um, and so in a way you could think of this as a somewhat watered, somewhat watered down account. I mean, I mean to be giving a serious so sort of full-blooded account of blame, but it, perhaps it's to a degree watered down insofar as I don't see it as allied with or entailing uh, the permissibility of punishment. In The Force and Fairness of Blame, Pamela Hieronymi says something like, she, she interprets resentment as tracking our judgments about wrongdoing or having been wronged, something, something like ill will, essentially. And, and I think that that's right. I think that we deserve blame, basically <laughs> deserve blame, uh, because our actions are, we have the kind of control, and it's compatible with determinism, such that our actions can be appropriate, can appropriately arouse negative reactive attitudes. Um, but that's, that's it. That doesn't tell us something about punishment. Great, uh, seven. Oh, uh, Dana, 
So back to Randy's mishap with the milk. Um, but it strikes me that um, an, an implication of uh, the way you treat the question of whether Randy is blameworthy or not has the effect of pretty drastically downgrading the importance of the omission itself, maybe downgrading it to the vanishing point. Um, the omission on the way you tell the story has evidential value. Um, that is, it points us in the direction of supposing that maybe Randy doesn't care sufficiently about his wife, um, but that's it. And it, what, it really, what his blameworthiness really depends on is whether he cares sufficiently about his wife. So I, I wonder what you would say then about this, this variant of, of the, um, Randy's case. As before, he's promised to um, bring home s some milk on his way home from work. Um, he, in fact, has very little concern for his wife, let us suppose. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as a result, he forgets. He's just about home. When he comes on, remember those big posters that got milk? You know, somebody with a milk uh -huh, mustache. Yeah, yeah. And Randy sees the poster and he says, gosh, I don't have milk, do I? And so he goes back and gets the milk. Um, and there, in fact, is no omission. Mm -hmm. The omission has been preempted, I suppose. Um, there's no omission, so he can't be blamed for the omission. Um, but all of the sort of conditions that you take to really determine whether he's blameworthy mm -hmm. um, are, of course, in place. So he still gets blamed on your account. but. In this telling of the story, un unlike the original tell telling, there is no omission. Yeah. So the omission just drops out as irrelevant. And this is perfectly general, right? I mean, it turns out that what people are praiseworthy and blameworthy for is their quality of will. And so what they do just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you really want to accept that implication. Yeah, yeah, I've been waiting for years now for somebody to say something like that to me. And I've occasionally, in the back of my mind, thought about it. But I've never really decided what I think. And actually, I mean, honestly, right, in the first chapter or so of In Praise of Blame, I think you, 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 you go on about this, about the, um, yeah, ultimately, I probably think that uh, what really matters is, is how you are on the inside. Um, that's what our blaming responses are trying to track. Now, in fact, we don't have very good access to the way people are on the inside. We wait around for them to act. Um, sometimes we wait around for the consequences of their actions, although that's especially misleading. But the way people act is our best, typically our best evidence, although they could give us testimony too. Um, if we were different kinds of beings, if we had different sort of access to people's moral orientation, I suspect that we wouldn't have any problem at all with thinking about blaming people independently of their actions. But as it is, we're not like that. We're, their actions seem especially salient to us. Though I think they're salient because of what they tell us about how they are. And their consequences of their actions are, are especially salient too, and I think that, that kind of distracts us. So. Um, Ultimately, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm happy, I suppose. Well, I'm not happy, but I'm willing to say, right, you're really blame, what you're really blameworthy for is what, what really gets the reactive attitudes going, negative reactive attitudes, is your moral orientation. Now, in that case, Randy isn't blameworthy for forgetting the milk, because he didn't, in fact, forget the milk. But you're right, it would be, his wife would be perfectly within her rights and reasonable for if she had access to how he is on the inside, under the facade that we see before us. Uh, she would be perfectly legitimate in blaming him to just the degree that she would have otherwise. But we, don't typically, we typically don't have that access. And so. isn't, but isn't there something worse about having those attitudes and also forgetting the milk? Um, and, oh, I don't know. No, I don't think so. I mean. Uh, uh. Uh, yeah, no, it's okay, worse, yeah, but not, not in a way that reflects morally on him. Yeah, it's a worse world, you know. He doesn't have the concern he ought to, and they don't have milk, so that's an extra bad, but it doesn't make him a worse person. Okay, 13. It's really from the 
frustrating coming this late with you. I had three questions that everybody's asked them, but that won't stop me from amending it. Let me just pick George's, which is the most recent. Uh -huh. You could have given an answer quite different. What was the answer Randy gave early in the morning with his OA and DR principles? Which is, it's a fault in you not to advert, but it's not as if you have an obligation to advert, and it's not as if you're blameworthy for not adverting, but it's a fault in you that nonetheless can have its place, its role, in what you are blameworthy for, which is the act of your mission. So you could have gone that route, but you didn't. Yeah, so it had... So, let me just give you that. So George says, okay, if you're going to go this route and have the omission drop out, mm -hmm. you could think it's intuitive that you could have a halfway house here. It could be like what we do with attempts. We blame you more if you succeed, those of us who are sensible about this, blame you more if you succeed than if you only try and fail. You could say the same about unrealized characterological defects. It's true you're blameworthy for not caring about your life, but you're more blameworthy if, because of that, you do an action or an omission that expresses it. So you could have a halfway house there. You have his complete retreat, and you have that the olive branch that George offered you that yeah. you refused. Yeah, um, well, you know, the different ways in which characterological defects might fail to be realized. I mean, they could fail to be realized in the sense that they don't have their full... Um, haven't come alive in your psychology. But what you mean is that they aren't expressed in behavior. But I just can't get behind the view that I just don't think that that matters. I mean, I think that that's, that's, all, that's all luck. Um, well, I mean, I mean, I'm okay with constitutive luck, uh, clearly, I suppose. But whether or not you actually did the action, I, uh, yeah, in the end, I don't, I mean, that, that's all we, we always we look for that we have to because we don't have much else to go on. But strictly speaking, yeah, I don't think that that makes him worse. I don't think it. I don't think it expresses a, a worse attitude just because he actually did forget it. So I don't think there are any grounds for additional blame now. And I th I think we can explain why there is often additional blame, and it would be in terms of a kind of irrational attribution or misattribution of blame grounding attitudes and judgments. But I, I, I don't see what could justify me blaming more in that case. I understand why I'm more upset, but m m getting extra moralized anger off the ground just because his bad attitudes happen to have this effect, I don't, I don't see how that works. I mean, I understand that that's how we do things typically, but I don't understand what the theory is behind that. Well, it depends what your baseline on luck is, and I don't know what it is, but if you're someone who believes in result luck as well as constitutive luck, yeah, and then this halfway house would look more attractive to you. Right, no, and I want to reject resultant luck insofar as I can. So, uh, 36. So, uh, uh, my question has been asked. Uh, it was introduced by Craig and then asked apparently when I was out of the room by, by George. But, but let me just ask if, if our forgettings are merely evidence of a character trait, may, you, know, you know, evidence that we, we might have gotten some other way. Um, and if it's the character trait that is the, uh, is the locus of blame, in, in this in this picture, um, then what do you so suppose I I don't I'm a person who lacks sufficient care. Let's say I've got the defective character. Mm -hmm. I realize this, but I don't want to to um, violate any any norms of behavior. So I, for example, with respect to forgetting, you know, I know I'm likely to forget my wedding because I'm going to go play golf in the morning and I could get very consumed by that and just forget that I was supposed to get married in the afternoon. Um, so I, I tell the groomsman that if you, you know, if you see me, I, I, could, I could get very engrossed in this golf game. And Fred, so I tell my groomsman, you know, run out. If you see me, you know, teeing off on the back nine, go, go stop me and tell me, you know, I got to go get to the shower. Now, so I end up not forgetting, I end up showing up at the church on time, whatever. Um, 
do I, do I get any, you know, how, how am I supposed to assess that? I've got the character traits, but I mm -hmm. don't violate any, any behavioral norms uh, in, in this case. Right, but simply being, I'll give a short answer. Um, uh, simply being forgetful is not itself blameworthy, right? Your, forget, your forgetting would have to be explained in terms of a lack of concern. If that were the case, yeah, I think that, that your, uh, your, your spouse-to-be. Uh -huh. You know that once you get engrossed in golf. Okay, but yeah, but I, don't, I don't see that your, your uh, fiancé would have grounds for blame in that case since you know this about yourself and you're taking, because of your concern for making it to the church on time, you're, you're taking steps to avoid uh, this, this from happening. Or avoid, avoiding this eventuality. But I mean, I take, I I take the, the point that, and I'm not sure how bad this really is. I mean, because I'm really comfortable with lots of other aspects of the view that I've been defending. Now, the thing that George was putting his finger on has always made me a little nervous. Um, but I, I, and I just say to that, well, yeah, if we were different sorts of beings that really had access to knowledge about, I'll say character traits following you, although that's not, I don't necessarily want to endorse uh, robust character traits. Uh, but if we had access into these facts about people, independently of their behavior, I think that we would use it. And it would it'd be perfectly normal for it to inform our judgments about them, our moral assessment of them, and our attitudes toward them. And in fact, that's not how we are. We use other ways of getting towards finding out about people's degree of respect for us. But ultimately, it's about how they're oriented towards us that matters. So, I man, I was very glad to hear you make reference to the empirical literature. We haven't heard much about that. And I just want to expand on that. I want you to expand on that because I would think if you're really serious in particular cases, you've got the framework, let's say. And in any particular case, if you want to know whether someone is blameworthy or to what extent, you actually would try to figure out causal explanations from action to will. And to do that, you wouldn't ask philosophers who aren't very good at figuring this out. You'd ask social scientists who presumably have a lot more to say about what's really going on causally when we do or don't do certain kinds of things. And that was then to refer to your empirical literature. So let's take, again, any particular case. So you've got, uh, I get a call from my wife uh, asking me to bring home uh, if she's my wife, she would want beer and not milk. So she's uh, telling me to stop and bring home beer. And let's suppose that I have just as much care and uh, caring for her as I do. We'll call, I mean, that's a constant, let's suppose, uh, on any given time. We'll call that phi. And it turns out that there are all kinds of variables that are going to affect how likely I am to remember to actually get the beer. Maybe I'll bet the empirical evidence shows that it depends how long the conversation is, whether she asked me to do this early or late in the conversation. It depends on how much ambient noise there is. It depends on whether there's someone else in the office or not when she asks me to bring home the beer. Suppose the empirical evidence indicates that we as human beings, and, and individuals like me in particular, are very, very affected by those kinds of causal variables. Then the inference to what, how much I care is not going to be very uh, credible, there's going to be all kinds of other factors going on. So I wonder if you really think that if we were in the business of taking this seriously in particular cases, that we would actually be really engrossed in this empirical literature before we were quick to make these inferences to quality of will. Is that a project you actually would seriously undertake if you were implementing the theory that you defend? Um, but the theory that I defend is that we ought to be skeptical about it. So I mean, I'm not sure. So, so how, do, how does what you're suggesting interact? I mean, well, I mean, skeptical. So whether, I don't know, you mean a priori skeptical? I mean, you'd really want to look at the empirical literature. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, uh, right, right. I mean, I, I, I want to find out, you know, about the mechanisms of forgetting what causes us to forget um, in terms of our neurology, but also in terms of situational factors. Um, what I'm particularly interested in is doing some more research on attribution error. I'm sure that there's something that people have studied 
the tendency to, to, to misattribute um, objectionable traits to people. But, um, but ultimately, right, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if all those things that you mentioned are, are accurate. Those really do affect us, but that would, yeah, so more reason to be skeptical, I get, I suppose. So I'm, I'm, I'm arguing against our sort of our complacency with respect to this issue. And I think that, yeah, you, you should have, you had in some general sense the capacities to, our standards require that you attend, you didn't. That's not enough, I, I want to argue, for, for blameworthiness. And right, once we know the fuller story, um, we'll, we'll be able to say it maybe more precisely how skeptical we ought to be. Though I guess I'm not very sanguine about much precision in that regard. Okay, so I'm one, so I'll leave you with a funny story. Um, I'm at the Padres game on Tuesday night. Why? Because my daughter is part of a theater troupe, and she was singing the national anthem along with the rest of her troupe on the field. And I was there with a video camera to videotape the experience, which I did, uh, but I was proud of myself because I didn't forget to stand up when the national anthem was being played. So I, I was very proud of myself. I mean, I don't always do this, you know, but I, no, I do always do this, but I do it. I do it, so I get up and I'm videotaping my, my, my daughter and I'm all proud of myself and I sit down and I've, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying the experience of looking at the video and this man comes up to me um, right in front of me, a complete stranger, never met him, and he said, sir, I'm a veteran and I couldn't help but notice that you didn't take your hat off at the time when the National Anthem was playing. How could you be so disrespectful as not to take your hat, as, you know, as to remove your hat? And my first reaction was, well, I won't tell you what my first reaction was. <laughs> but, <laughs> right, no. I, I, had, I actually had thoughts of answering him in French, uh, but I, um, so I thought, so, this, this case makes me think about a couple of things. First, I thought, well, you know, in some way, I, it was inappropriate, and I am blameworthy for having kept my hat on. But then if I think to myself, you know, what do I actually think about veterans? Um, you know, my three uncles were veterans, and I, you know, I have great respect for veterans and what they give to our country and so on. And who are you, who are you to question my, you know, my commitment to veterans? Now, okay, now Matthew Talbert is sitting you know, next to this guy and he comes over to me and rather than say what this veteran said, Matthew is a veteran, let's suppose, rather than say what, what this man said to me, uh, Matthew is thinking, well, first I have to find out what, you know, what Sam's quality of will is, or, you know, what his whole motivational set is, or, you know, does he throw parties for veterans on the weekends? Does he, you know, what has he done for veterans lately? Does he give lectures to veterans about, you know, this, that, and the other? And, um, I, no, I, I just think that just seems like three thoughts too many. So that was my question. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um. Right, and it may even be worse than that. I mean, maybe you have to decide how likely does it have to be that he has that quality of will before I um, indulge myself in, in blame, and, and does that probability shift in different cases? But I, I, it just seem, it seems to me clear that resentment is, as a, is an emotional response to the judgment that you've been wronged. That's what it tracks, that you've done, done wrong, that you've expressed an objectionable attitude. And so if you want to make sure that your blame is apt, then you ought to attend to that. And if it's difficult to find that out, then we should be a bit more hesitant than, than we are. Um, some other things I want to say, too, and something that I didn't emphasize is that there are negative assessments that um, we can make of you, right? I mean, maybe, maybe you're forgetful. There are criticisms that are... That, that are that are going to be apt. They might not be moral criticisms, but 
criticisms nonetheless, and things that you might care about, things that you might not like about yourself, might not be happy about, and you might have reason to regret having given offense and feeling bad about that, that you, I mean, I think the, the, the intersection of issues about uh, agent regret, I haven't thought about, I'm aware of them, uh, but it would be interesting to think exactly what kind of response ought you to have. I mean, some sort of regret does seem appropriate, but not necessarily taking on moral guilt. Some sort of apology seems appropriate, but apology in the sense that I was talking about it at the end of the paper. But I get the, I get the one thought too many, but that's just, yeah, we're apt to blame when we ought not. Okay, well, thanks, um, thanks to everyone. Um,